Hello and welcome to this session. This is Professor Farhat and this session we're going to be looking at accounting method used for tax purposes. This topic is covered in an income tax course, the CPA exam regulation section, as well as the enrolled agent exam. As always, I would like to remind you, my viewers, to connect with me on LinkedIn. If you have a LinkedIn account, please connect with me on a professional level. Also, if you're a Facebook user, I do have a Facebook page. You could also connect with me on a personal level if you chose to. YouTube is where I house all my lectures. You want to make sure you subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you do like this recording or other recordings, please like them, share them with others, let the world know about them. This is my Twitter account and I do have a website where I house my courses and lectures. Let's go ahead and get started. We're talking about accounting methods today. So what is the big idea about this topic, accounting method? Which accounting method are we using? Well, the accounting method, it's going to determine when to recognize the revenue and when to recognize the expense or the deduction for tax purposes. So simply put, once we determine the accounting the accounting method, it's going to tell us when. In other words, that's important. When this amount is taxable and when this amount is deductible because we need to know this. This is important for us for tax purposes. Now, keep in mind the IRS objective. In your opinion, what is the IRS objective? Well, the IRS objective is to increase revenue. This is the IRS objective. So keep in mind as we go through this that the IRS, the, the rules, they want you to recognize revenue as early as possible because if you recognize revenue, revenue is taxable. So your tax bill will increase and they want you to defer. They want you to slow down your expenses. So this is basically just have knowing this information right at the, at the get go. It gives you an, a big idea, a general idea about the topic for today. Okay. But this is what we're going to be discussing, the different accounting methods. Now, there are generally three permissible methods that the IRS allows you to use. One is the cash basis, and it's called the technical term is called cash receipts and cash disbursements. But from your financial accounting courses, you would know it as the cash basis of accounting. You have the accrual method, which is you sh hopefully you are familiar with the accrual method. And you have the hybrid method. The hybrid method is, as the word hybrid suggests, it's a combination of one and two, a combination of the cash method for some items and accrual method for other. Now, the general rule, the IRS, what the IRS wants you to do, they want you to use the method that, that's employed consistently and clearly reflect your income. So whatever reflect your income, use it consistently, whatever that method is. That's the general rule. And this is what you should be using, but you do have different methods, either one, two, or three. Now, you're going to have always exceptions. So I'm just going to warn you up front about this session. I'm going to tell you the rule. Then there are going to be exceptions. So every rule I'm going to mention, there's going to be exception to it. Okay. Hopefully we'll try to focus on the general rule. But remember, we do have a lot of exception when it comes to recognizing revenues and deductions on the income tax return. Okay. The first general rule I'm going to go over is this. Certain taxpayer whose average annual gross receipts, okay, computed over the prior three years. So we'd look at, we'd look at the prior three years. So one, two, three. We'd look at the prior three years. And if your average, okay, exceeds 25 million in gross sales, then what you have to do, you have to use the accrual method for sales and cost of goods sold if inventory is a major part of your income producing activity. Simply put, if you are selling inventory and your average sales for the past three years is 25 million or more, you have to use the accrual, then you cannot use the cash method. Okay, this is the first general rule. We're going to revisit this rule in a moment. So let's go ahead and cover each one separately, starting with one, cash disbursement and cash receipt. Pretty straightforward. Cash receipt and cash disbursement method basically state your income is recognized. So simply put, you, are, you have income, you have revenue that's taxable when you actually receive it or you constructively received it. Actually means you actually have the money or constructively means you have access to the money. For example, if you have the check, if the check is sitting in your mailbox, although you didn't pick it up from your mailbox, you have access to the money, therefore you constructively received it. Or if the if your brokerage account received dividend revenue on your behalf, well, guess what? That revenue is taxable, although you don't have the money, but the money is sitting in your brokerage account, you have access to it. Expenses, pretty pretty much the same, are deductible when they are paid. So once you write the check, your expenses are deductible. Now, remember, there are certain items that we can prepay for. 
prepayment. So how do we deal with prepayment when you prepay for expenses? There is a, a general rule. It's called the one-year rule for prepaid. What is the one-year rule? Basically, when you prepay for something, remember from a financial accounting perspective, let's assume we prepay for our insurance. What we do is we debit prepaid insurance. Just kind of reminding you what we do for financial accounting purposes. And we credit cash, $10,000. Remember, prepaid is an asset. Now, how, how do you treat this transaction if you prepay for your insurance from a tax from a tax perspective? Remember, what is your goal as a taxpayer? Your goal is to treat this as an expense. Your goal is to expense the 10000 because more expenses means lower tax bill. So here's what happened. The IRS says there's a one-year rule for prepaid. Simply put, it permits the taxpayer to deduct the expenditure, which is the $10,000, as long as it doesn't extend beyond the 12 month after the first date on which the taxpayer realized the right. So simply put, if this money is for 12 months, if it's for 12 months, then guess what? You can take the whole thing as an expenditure or it doesn't extend beyond it, the, it doesn't extend beyond the earlier of the end of the tax year following the year of payment. So it doesn't go more than one year from the payment. Uh, payment year. As long as that's the case, you can expense it. Simply put, as long as your prepaid is within one year or one year and a little bit, you know, the, the following year, you can expense it. So your goal is to expense it. So they tell you, well, if it's within one year, you can expense it. Otherwise, if you prepaid for insurance for three years or for four years or for two full years, then you cannot expense it. Then what do you have to do? It's basically, uh, prorate the amount of the expense, just like for financial accounting purposes. Okay. Now, there are some some restriction on the use of cash receipt and cash disbursement method. Okay, there are exceptions and exceptions to the exceptions. What are those exceptions? Cash method cannot be used by corporation, partnership, with a corporate partner, and tax shelters. Then there are exceptions to this. If you're a farming business and there's a lot of exceptions for the farming business, you are allowed to use the cash method. Okay, if you're a farming business. If you are a qualified personal service corporation or personal service company, then what is the what is a qualified personal service company? We'll talk about this later on. It's when you are like, for example, as an accountant. If I'm if I run my own company, I am I'm providing the service, the majority of the service. Then I'm a personal service company. If I'm a lawyer, I'm an actuarial science architect. Basically, I am the company, personal service company. Okay. A corporation or a partnership with a corporate partner that's not a tax shelter whose average annual gross receipts for all prior three years is $28 million or less. So the corporation could still use the cash method as long as the prior three years, their average gross receipts is less than $25 million. Once it exceeds $25 million, then that's it. The cash method can no longer be used. Also, there's another exception. Regulation require a cruel method to measure sales and cost of goods sold if inventory is a material component of your business. So if you're selling goods and services and inventory is a material part of your business, then you have to use the accrual. Then here's a new rule for it. The prohibition of the on the use of cash method is intended to ensure that annual income is clearly reflected. Because remember, the reason is when you buy inventory, think about it. When you buy inventory, we debit inventory then you credit accounts payable. Remember, inventory is an asset. Then what you do is inventory or purchases, it doesn't matter. Then when you sell the asset, you will debit cost of goods sold, then you credit inventory, okay? So simply put, you tax, let's assume we're dealing with a 10,000, that's a simple example. You bought 10,000 of inventory, then you sold the inventory. The cost of goods sold is 10,000. Simply put, when do you expense it? You expense it when you sell it. Now, if you're using the cash method, if you're using the cash method, strictly the cash method, what you would say, if I bought the inventory, then the inventory is cost of goods sold. I need to expense it if I'm using the cash method. Therefore, if you have inventory, you have to use the accrual. The accrual basically is simply put, well, the inventory is an asset until it's sold. So it's, you are matching the inventory with the sale. When you sell it, you turn it into a cost of goods sold. So simply put, let me just, so I don't want to confuse anyone. Let me go back to the example and here let's assume you sold it for fifteen thousand you debit account receivable fifteen you credit sales fifteen thousand so simply put and maybe i should do this just to kind of illustrate the point simply put you expensed it oops you expensed it when you 
cost of goods sold 10,000 okay so notice you expensed it when you made the sale when you made the sale for 15,000 you expense the inventory so you're matching your cost of goods sold to the sales those two they go on the same date you are matching the expense to the revenue and this is what accrual this is what accrual is therefore if you have inventory you have to use the accrual I just said this and I'm gonna tell you something else that according to the new tax cuts and jobs act they made significant changes and they allow more small businesses to use the cash method even though they have inventory now smaller businesses now what they do is although you have inventory in the past if you have inventory if inventory is a substantial part of your business you have to do you know buy the inventory first which is an asset buy the inventory then when you sell it, it turn into cost of goods sold you know to turn into cost of goods sold with the tax cats and jobs act again what they do they told business if you're a small business and without even going the definition of a small business you can as soon as you buy the inventory you can expense it because you technically you are using the cash method because the cash method when you buy something you ex, you expense it therefore what's going to happen is so what's the purpose of it let's just think about the purpose the purpose is to give businesses more deductions more expenses so they want the business to buy more goods because if you buy more goods more inventory you can expense it by expensing it you will take more deduction okay now remember there are special rules for small farmers fyi let's take a look at a couple examples just to see how this whole thing fits together stern and stern cpa is a c sorry sorry let me go back to uh, the example okay stern and stern is a cpa is a c corporation owned by 10 cpas that provide accounting and tax services its average annual gross receipts are about 30 million this this entity because it's a cpa firm it qualifies as a personal service corporation p s c and it has no inventory because a cpa firm don't have inventory although you're a c corporation and you have more than 30 million in sales because you're a personal service company you can use the cash method you can use the cash method why because there's an exception if you are a personal service company like an accounting firm a law firm actuarial science architect what is a personal service corporation or company i always say company it's the owner slash manager the owner is also the business themselves okay let's take a look at the other example fit corporation is a c corporation this is a c corporation that operates several fitness centers its average annual gross receipts are 30 million well guess what fit must use the accrual method because it's a C corporation it's av it's average annual gross receipts for the prior three years exceed 25 million so they have to use the accrual method if let's assume the average annual receipts in the prior three year were 20 million or less under those circumstances it could use the cash method if fit was a sole proprietorship a partnership without a C partner okay or an S corporation it would be allowed to use the cash method regardless of the gross receipts level because it's not subject to the required accrual method rule 448 and has no inventory okay so notice here a c corporation if you're more than 25 million you have to use the accrual if you're less than 25 million you can use the cash method okay but if the business was a sole proprietorship a partnership without a c corporation partner so the none of the partners are c corporation or an s corporation then you have the option to use whatever you want to as long as you don't have inventory which is a fitness center should not have any inventory okay now this is the cash method let's move on to the accrual method okay the accrual method hopefully you are generally generally you should be familiar with the accrual method because it's something that you should have learned in your financial accounting okay what is the accrual method the accrual method is recognized when it's earned the income not the accrual method income is recognized revenue is recognized when it's earned now for tax purposes we have something called all event test so we need to talk a little bit more about the all event test okay under the all event test income is earned when all events have occurred to fix the taxpayer right to the income simply put again i'm going to explain it from a financial accounting perspective you performed your service you perform the contract requirement whatever is expected of you, you did perform it and the amount can be reasonably estimated or it's estimated with reasonable accuracy the amount can be determined with reasonable accuracy as long as you did the, your work and as long as you have the right to the income in, in other words you satisfied your obligation 
whatever that obligation is, and the amount can be reasonably estimated, then you have access to the income. Then you have you have you have income. Okay. However, the income cannot be deferred beyond the tax year in which it's included in the taxpayer applicable financial statement. So if you happen to defer the income, you cannot defer it more than one year after you recognize it in the financial statement. So how much can you because your goal, what is your goal as a taxpayer? Your goal is to defer. Your goal is to defer income. What is defer income means? Means push it down the road. You don't want to recognize the income now. You want to recognize the income later. So you would recognize it if those two conditions met or if you recognize it in the financial statement, you have one year max after you recognize it in the financial statement. Okay? You have one year max. Let's take a look at an example. Andre, Corp Andre Corporation is a calendar year, calendar year taxpayer that uses accrual basis of accounting was to receive a bonus equal to 6% of blue corporation net income for its fiscal year ending June 30th. Okay, so let's take a look at this. This is 2018. This is 2019. For the fiscal year ending tw June 30th, 2018, blue corporation had net income of 240,000. So the blue corporation, which is he's going to receive the bonus from, this is when their year ends, June 30th. This is when their year end. And according to their year end, they made net income of 240000 Then, Then in the next six months, the, corp the blue corporation made $150,000 of income. So what would, what would Andre Corporation recognize? Well, guess what? The year end for June, for June 30th, because remember, Andre Corporation, the, this is the blue corporation year end and this is Andre year end year end so what would Andre recognize an income for 2018 well he would recognize an income Andre would recognize the 240,000 times 6% which is 14,400 because it's right that the amount became fixed when blue corporation year closed so guess what we know for sure the amount okay as of june 30th 20, two, uh, june 30th the corporation made 240000 and we are qualified we are qualified to receive we are eligible not qualified eligible to receive 6% now the 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 following 6 months of the of the blue corporation i know they have an income of 140 but we really don't know what their net income is until when until june 30th of 2019 Okay, because Blue Corporation, their year end is 2019. Therefore, we're not going to accrue anything for the 150 because the amount is not yet is not yet fixable. Who knows? Maybe by, by the time they get to 2019, they will have a loss, right? Because it's based on the final net income for the year. Okay, so we cannot estimate what's going to be the net income for Blue Corporation. And we're not sure if that 50 is going to stand or it's going to go away. Okay, therefore, we only recognize the net income for the 240000 And this is what we meant to say. It can be determined with a reasonable accuracy. We cannot determine how much income the company will have by the end of 20, by June 30th, 2019, the end of fiscal year. Okay? Also, accrual taxpayer recognize income based on the right to receive the income, not the fair value. What does that mean? If you exchange goods and services with somebody else and they said you have the right to receive income of 20,000 that's your right but they gave you a vehicle a car that's worth 17,000 guess what you recognize 20,000 you don't recognize the fair market value of the vehicle okay because that's your right to the income that's your right to the income so let's look at an example M corporation an accrual taxpayer has provided services to a client and has the right to receive 60,000 the client has signed notes receivable to Marcy that have a fair market value of 57000 I don't care what the fair market value is. If I'm an accrual taxpayer, I am going to recognize 60. The corporation must include 60000 the amount it has the right to receive in its gross income rather than the fair market value of the note. Now, if you're saying, what if this person was a cash method taxpayer? Well, if you're a cash method, you'd only recognize 57000 if you're a cash method taxpayer, then if they eventually pay you the three thousand, then you would recognize the three thousand to make it sixty thousand. Okay. Now more about accrual. Remember, under accrual, you have to recognize income based on the performance. What happened if you somebody paid you in advance? Paid you in advance. So what are we talking about here? Payment in advance for services, goods, or software, and this is very common. If they paid you in advance, 
generally speaking, if they pay you in advance, guess what? The IRS says if you have the money, you have to you have to pay taxes. That's that's the general. However, you can elect the deferral method because remember, our tax system is based on the ability to pay. So if somebody paid you money. If somebody paid you money, you have the money. As far as tax purposes, you have to pay the taxes because you have the money, right? Versus financial accounting, it's different rule. So generally speaking, you have to report the income unless you elect the deferral method under section, it's called section 150, 451. So here's how section 151 work. In the year of receipt, recognize the same income that's reported in the financial statement. So simply put, when you receive that advance payment, here's what you do. You see, this is my financial statement and this is my tax return. You would say, okay, in the year of receipt, let's assume I recognize from this advance payment $80,000 for financial accounting purposes. On my tax return, I need to recognize $80,000 if I choose this method. So for the first year, whatever I did on my financial statement, if I recognize if my revenue from this contract is $80,000 for financial statements, I would recognize $80,000 for tax purposes. In the subsequent year, this is year one, this is year one, and year two, in the subsequent year, for tax purposes, you have to include all the advance payment. Now, for financial statements, you could still be recognizing 80,000, you know, for the next three years. But for tax purposes in the subsequent year, you, in the subsequent year, you have to include all. So they give you a little bit of a break. So the first year, whatever you did on the financial statement, report for tax purposes. Subsequent year, that's it. Whatever you did on the financial statements, it's irrelevant for us. The IRS wants you to include all that money in your taxes. Therefore, they want their, their, want their share of taxes. They want you to pay taxes. So you can defer it a little bit, just a little bit. That's if you elect. You could also pay the whole taxes in the, whole, in the same year. Now, why? That depends on your tax strategy. Troy Corporation is an accrual taxpayer that has pro pro properly adopted the deferral method which is section 451C. Troy sells computer for a two-year service contract on the computers. On November 1st, Troy sold, a Troy Corporation sold a 24-month service contract and received $240 in advance. For financial reporting purposes, for, for on, the financial on the financial statement, Troy report uh, $20 of gross income. So revenue, I'm just gonna call it revenue, for financial reporting, for that year, they reported 20000 Although they received $240 in cash, for financial reporting, they reported only $20. So for that year, for tax purposes, if you elected 451, you can report $20, okay? This is for 2018. For 2019, the revenue for financial accounting was 120, and for 2020, for 2020, the revenue was 100. Okay, so they accounted for everything. This is for financial accounting purposes. For tax purposes, by year two, you have to report the remainder, $220. And this is what I was trying to say earlier. So they give you, they'll give you a chance, uh, they'll, give you, they'll give you a break the first year, but any subsequent year, you'll have to include the whole income. Okay? Hopefully, you know how Section 451C work now. So year one, you can follow your financial statement. Subsequent year, you cannot. Now, there's an exception to this rule. And what's the exception? If you get any prepaid rental income, prepaid interest income, warranty, guaranteed contract, insurance premium, and certain payment for financial institution, those, they don't qualify for Section 451. So simply put, simply put, focus on interest and rental. If you receive any prepaid interest, any prepaid rental, then you cannot use section 451c to defer that income you have to what does that mean if you cannot defer it if you cannot defer it you have to tax the whole thing up front okay you have to tax the whole thing up front so simply put let's assume this example just to kind of show you side by side this example let's assume this was you know prepaid rental prepaid rental if this was prepaid rental from a financial from a financial statement perspective from a financial statement perspective you would recognize twenty dollars in 2018 from a tax perspective guess what the whole thing the 240 will be revenue for 2018 because you cannot defer any of it okay because it's an exception it's a, it was a prepaid rental 
Now let's take a look at accrual accounting from the deduction perspective. From a deduction perspective, expenses are deductible when a three-part test is met. This is a three-part test. The first one is an all event test. What does the all event test mean? An all event test means do you legally owe the money to another party? Do you have an obligation to pay? An all event has occurred to establish the fact that a liability exists. When does a liability exist? When the taxpayer legally owes the money. When do you legally owe the money? When someone provides a service to you. Simply put, if somebody delivered the product, provided the service, then you are you are in the contract based on the contract. You have to pay them, then you have to pay them. Also, the amount, you can reasonably estimate the amount. You could reasonably estimate the amount. You have to know how much you are paying. And the third test is something called the economic performance, economic performance test. Economic performance test. And the economic performance test, it depends on the nature of the liability. Okay, so when do we, when the economic performance test is satisfied, depending on what we are dealing with. And there's an exception to this economic performance test, something called reoccurring items. Let's take a look at a few examples just to kind of give you an idea how the economic performance test work. So let's assume the taxpayer uses the owner's use of owner's owner's property. Let's assume you, you are renting a property. When do you recognize the expense? When the economic performance test is satisfied? Readably over the period used. So if you have an, when do you recognize rent expense? Well, over the period in which you are using that property. Specific property provided at the taxpayer. For example, the company office supplies are purchased. So when do you expense them? When, guess what? When the taxpayer receives the supplies. So when do you, well, if I receive the supplies, that's it, I have an expense, I have an expense. Specific services provided to the taxpayer. Somebody provide you a specific, specific service, okay? For example, the contract, the taxpayer contracts for repair to be made to its equipment. So we contracted somebody to make repair to our equipment. When are we, when the performance test is satisfied? When can we take the deduction? When the repairs are made. When we do the repair, we have to do it. Because remember, we have to, we have an expense. This is, this is accrual accounting. Now, if this was cash accounting, we wait until we pay them. Services to, to be provided for a specific time period. Here we are talking about a contract for a specific time period. The taxpayer purchased a service contract, such as cleaning services. Well, if it's a contract, you spread the contract gradually over the contract price. Property or services provided by the taxpayer. Okay, a, man a manufacturer provides a warranty on items sold to customers. So here's what's happening is this. They bought something from you and you are giving them a warranty. Well, guess what? when the manufacturers incur costs in fixing the customer item. So here, we, there's no, and we're gonna talk about this, you cannot estimate, there's no reserve. You cannot estimate, you cannot estimate warranty expense. So what happened, if you, if you provided a warranty expense, you wait until the customer comes back and this is when you expense it. This is when we, what we meant by economic performance test. So simply put, you cannot use the accrual that we know about financial accounting. For financial accounting, if you provide a warranty, you can accrue the warranty, not for tax purposes. The warranty, the expense takes place when the customer comes back. Rebates. So for example, manufacturers rebate based on quantity purchase. So if you granted a rebate when the rebate is paid. So it's not an expense. You cannot estimate a rebate expense, which you can do for financial accounting, but not for tax purposes. Tort claim. Okay, customer are awarded claim for harm caused by the taxpayer product. Well, guess what? For financial accounting, you you might be able, you might have to estimate the liability. You have to estimate the contingent liability. Well, not for tax purposes. When the payment is made to the injured party, okay, and tort claim, they are not eligible for something called reoccurring item exception. So it's not something that we do on a regular basis. State income taxes, for example, if you owe taxes on your income taxes, state income taxes, when the payment is made. Also, this is eligible for reoccurring item. So if you pay taxes on a regular basis and you can estimate that amount, then you don't have to pay it, you can book it. But generally speaking, when the payment is made, unless it's it's gonna be considered what we called reoccurring item, which we'll talk about in a moment, okay? So let's take a look at kind of some common examples, okay? One common liability is where the taxpayer has the liability because another party provided the service. So this is a very common example. An accrual calendar year taxpayer, JAB, promoted a box and match held in the company's arena on December 31st, 2018. CLN had contracted to clean the arena for $5,000, but did not actually perform the work until January 1st. So simply put, JAB contracted them, said, you need to fix my, you need to clean the arena once the, 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 the match is done. So here's what happened. 
this is when the revenue took place for jab revenue took place for jab and cln supposed to perform the work here cmn did not perform the work until 2019 and jab paid them in 2020 the five thousand dollar here's what's going to happen Although the financial accounting rules require JAP to accrue the 5,000 cleaning expense in 2018. So from a financial accounting perspective, the revenue took place and the cleaning should take place too at the same time because matching revenue to expenses. However, they did not clean until January 2019. This is 2019. They did not perform the service. So the performance did not was not incurred until 2019. Okay, so guess what? Because you didn't do the work until 2019, I have to wait. To expense it until 2019 so jab cannot expense that five thousand dollar until 2019 when cln performed the service under the accrual method and here we are assuming that this is not a non-reoccurring item so this is not a reoccurring item we'll see what the recurring item is but for using the cash basis we would have to wait until 2020 to expense that item okay but for jab the expense take place in 2019 because this is when the actual service was performed. The actual service was performed. Again, if this was a recurring item, we might have be able to do it and uh, to deduct it in 2018. Okay. Now, if the taxpayer is obligated to provide property or services, economic performance occur in the year the taxpayer incurred the cost in satisfying it's the obligation to provide the service. Now, if you are expected to provide the service, well, when you provide that service, this is when the performance occur. AJ Max Corporation, farmlands owned by an individual. AJ Max contract to use the land for three years. And at the end of the three years, AJ Max agreed to apply lime to the farmland. So they rented the land and after three years, they are expected to apply lime. The contract term expired in 2018 and AJ Maxx applied the line in 2019. So simply put, you're supposed to do it by the end of the contract, but you did not do it until 2019. The whole event test was satisfied by 2018 because this is when you're supposed to do. However, AJ Maxx did not provide the line until 2019. Well, guess what? Since you did not provide the service until 2019, the deduction will have to wait until 2019 when you actually provide the service. When you actually provide the service, again, we're assuming here you know, applying line is not a reoccurring item exception. So what is reoccurring item exception? We can talk, we keep talking about this, okay? The economic performance require, requirement is accelerated and thus year-end accrual may be deducted if the following conditions are met. So if the following conditions are met, we don't have to wait for the performance. In other words, we can take the deduction, we can take the deduction earlier we can take the deduction earlier and we like this we want to take the deduction earlier when is that when is that when is that permissible the all event test is met and the amount of the liability can be determined with reasonable accuracy well guess what the all event test occur okay you have some some sort of an obligation but the performance did not happen remember the all event test that's not good enough you have to have the performance Economic performance occur on or before the earlier of the date of the taxpayer files the return or eight and a half months after the close of the taxable year. So the economic performance, it's going to occur before the earlier of the taxpayer filed the return. So it's, it didn't happen yet, but it's going to happen before you file the return or if you have an extension, eight and a half months after the close date of the taxable year. The item is reoccurring in nature. Reoccurring means it's a regular expense that you pay on a regular basis. And either the item is not material, so the item is not of a large amount, or accrue when it result in a better matching of revenues and expenses. So it has to meet all of them, not only one, all of them, all of them. So accrue when it result in a better matching of revenue and expenses. So if we go back to that $5,000 of the cleaning, I'm assuming this was a material amount because it was a material amount, we cannot consider it as a reoccurring item. If it was not material, basically, and Okay, it's not only material, it was not reoccurring. Okay, maybe it's not reoccurring. So it has to meet all those four items. And the best way is to look at an example to see how this works. Okay, a green corporation often sells goods that are on hand that cannot be shipped for another week. So they sell the good on a regular basis. So notice, the old event test for the sale is satisfied. So those, because we're going to have to sell it. We sell it on a regular basis. Okay. The revenue is recognized, although the goods have not yet been shipped to the 
to the customer. So although we did not ship it, we did not perform the service, but we're gonna we're gonna do it. It's a regular it's a regular thing. So its revenue is recognized. Green Corporation is obligated to pay shipping cost. Although the company obligation for shipping cost can be determined with reasonable accuracy, we know how much the shipping cost it's gonna cost us. Economic performance is not satisfied until Green actually delivers the good. So notice the performance. The, the economic performance is not satisfied because we did not ship the goods. However, accruing shipping costs on sold items will, bet, will better match revenue with expenses. Therefore, the company should be allowed to accrue the shipping costs on items sold but not yet shipped to the customer. So since we, uh, we, since we said we sold it, since we, we know how much the shipping cost is, we also assume the shipping cost is not material. We also assuming and we could fairly assume that shipping cost is a, is a, is a reoccurring item. Therefore, under those circumstances, we can say this is a recurring item and we can accrue shipping cost. Okay. Now bear in mind the economic performance test as set forth in the code does not address all possible accrued expenses. So in, in many circumstances you have to make your own judgment. But they also tell us when you cannot you cannot treat certain things as reoccurring expenses. Under some under some instances, economic performance is not satisfied until the liability is paid. So under certain instances, which we're, which we're gonna see what they are, you cannot assume economic performance. You cannot use that reoccurring uh, exception. For example, workers' compensation, it's not an expense until you pay it. Tort, breach of contract, violation of law, rebate or refund, this is, it's in the law, but you, you have some exceptions there. Awards, prizes, and jackpots. Insurance, warranty, and service contract, and taxes. Again, five and eight, they could be subject to, re, to the reoccurring item. So depending on the situation, but those are clearly stated that you cannot, you cannot expense them until you pay. So you cannot assume economic performance. You cannot assume economic performance took place. Okay, let's take a look at this. Yellow Corporation sold defective merchandise that injured the customer. Yellow admitted liability in 2018, but did not pay the claim until 2019. The customer tort claim cannot be deducted until it's paid, although they admitted it 100%. Now, from a financial accounting, from a, so on the financial statements, okay, let's assume this was $50,000, they will deduct, they will have an expense of $50,000 in 2018. Okay, tax in 2018, nothing, although they admitted. Now, in 2019, what's going to happen is the expense for tax purposes will be $50,000 for financial accounting. It's already, they already took it in 2019. Okay, the tort claim, you have to wait until you pay it. Let's look at another example. P Corporation filed its 2018 state income tax return in March of 20, in March of 2019. So let's take a look at a timeline here. Let's look at a timeline here. This is 2018 and this is 2019. So you file your income tax return in March for the year 2018. And you did this on September 15, 2019. So this is when you actually did it. This is when you actually filed the return of 2018. You had an extension. At the same time, at the same time the state return was filed here, Pelican was required to pay an additional $5,000. So you paid $5,000 here. The state taxes are eligible for reoccurring item exception because if you have income, you're going to have state taxes. So it's an it's an item that's it's reoccurring, and we're going to assume it's not material. Thus, the five thousand dollars state income taxes can be deducted in twenty for twenty eighteen. So this amount, although we're paying it in twenty nineteen, but we can deduct it in that year. In that year means for twenty eighteen taxes. The deduction is allowed because all the event has occurred to file. To fix the liability, we know how much we have to pay as of the end of 2018. So at the end of 2018, we know how much we are responsible to pay for. Okay, and the payment was made by the earlier of the of the return filing date, which is eight and a half month after the year end, and the item is reoccurring in nature. So again, you have to pay taxes every year. So that's reoccurring in nature. Okay. So therefore, and it's better match revenues to expenses because the tax, this tax is, this 5,000 belongs to 2018 year, not 2019. Therefore, it's better off deducting it in 2018. As I told you earlier, you cannot make estimate. There's no reserves 
for tax purposes generally the all event and economic performance tests will prevent the use of reserve what are the reserve basically estimating product warranty allowance for bad debt you cannot estimate those for tax purposes those are frequently used in financial accounting now if you're a small bank there's some exception but we're not going to go there okay hybrid method involved the use of use more than one method for example cash a combination of cash and accrual generally used when inventory is a material factor remember when you have inventory you have to use the accrual method for inventory however okay um, because of the tax cuts and jobs act of 2019 what's going to happen if you have inventory you could use the cash basis therefore less and less people will be using the hybrid method okay so accrual accounting used for determining gross profit and cash used is for other purposes this is what an example of an accrual so for for inventory purposes you would use the accrual but for everything else you would use the cash method okay again many businesses that use the cash that you many because many of the business that used they used it before these changes would likely use the cash method even if they have inventory because the tax cuts and jobs acts they allow you to use the cash method for small businesses for small businesses what happened if you change accounting method okay the taxpayer elects accounting method for subsequent year by filing the initial return so you could change it you must obtain permission from the IRS to change the accounting method and sometimes you're gonna have to have adjustments maybe required to to prevent this distortions of taxable income okay if you made an error that's not a change in accounting method that's not a change in accounting method so what happened when you have a change in accounting method well here's what's going to happen required changes in accounting method um, are the result of an irs examination so if the irs says you have to change your method if this is irs method okay irs will not require a change unless the adjustment is positive so when does the irs ask you to change your method is when you the new method will have more taxable income. In other words, you have to pay more taxes. So what do you have to do when you have to pay more taxes? If the IRS says, your method is not acceptable, you have to choose the other method, okay? Adjustment generally must be included in gross income for the year in, of change. Adjustment will include taxes and interest on the bill due because you did not pay enough taxes, you're gonna have to pay interest and taxes because you were using the old method. If the adjustment is more than $3,000, in other words, you have to pay more than 3000 The taxpayer can elect to calculate tax by spreading the adjustment over one or more previous periods. So you could, they'll give you some exception to kind of spread the payment out. For voluntary changes, that's if you do it here, if the IRS asks you to do it here, if you do it from an incorrect method to facilitate the change to a correct method. So if, if you do it from incorrect method to an from an incorrect to a correct method the IRS generally allow the taxpayer to spread the positive adjustment in future years so if you have a uh, if you have a positive adjustment you have to pay more income but you did it voluntarily then they will tell you do it do the adjustments for future year positive adjustment versus the prior year if they did it themselves if they ask you to do it one fourth of the adjustment is applied to the year of change one fourth of the adjustment is applied to each of the next three years so they allow you to do it 25 percent if you have a negative adjustment in other words you change from the incorrect method to a correct method and as a result you have more deductions you can take the deduction in the year of change and this is basically what i'm going to go over in the session in the next session i'm going to work examples more and more examples to illustrate this concept if you have any questions email me if you're studying for your cpa exam study hard if you happen to use my website for additional lectures please consider donating study hard for your exam it's worth it good luck